that's my presentation of Trade Zone. Do you want me to load it? You might, I mean, if people started asking, I don't know if it's coming. Oh, it might be over there. Oh, I see. Well, I think mine is minimized. These this is yours. Uh, right. You can put the uh, full screen, whatever. Full screen. I think this is a, OK, my eyes. <laughs> I know that are in far sight already. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Eric Worker. I'm a professor uh, at Harvard Business School and also the country director for Liberia. Um, our session is on elite capture and political economy, and we are thrilled to have two illustrious speakers. And, and I've been stopped in, in between them and asked to also give a brief discussion. Uh, but, but but giving our, our framework talk will be Professor Gerard Padro y Miguel uh, from the London School of Economics, also the IGC Research Program Director uh, uh, for, for States. And then our, our discussant will be Nicholas Waddle from DFID, who works as a governance advisor with the growth team. Okay, without further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, Gerard. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll have the, the three of us speak and then open it up at the end for Hello, so I'm um, Gerard Padro, as Eric said, thank you for uh, starting me. So let me, let me, um, yeah, so let me start by saying when I was invited to do a talk on elite capture, um, as something that really concerns you know, certain developing countries. Um, I thought I would use this almost as an excuse also to present, and, and I was also thought this was supposed to be a framework. So then I, uh, I, um, I kind of did an excuse to basically match these two themes and somehow something useful comes out of it like this. Um, as usual with, um, with what I say, that we're going to end up with more questions than answers, but hopefully a little bit more structured questions. That's my, that's my hope um, for today. So let me just start with a very, um, oops, this is not going to sleep well. This works, yeah. So, so I'm going to start with, so let me just think, I'm going to go back to elite capture. So at this point, let me just say that we tend to think very, very, uh, a very um, imprecise definition of elite capture is simply we have this feeling that uh, powerful people in countries get away with, um, with either legislation or in practice the way things are done. Um, with practices that disproportionately benefit them, right? That's basically, and I'm going to come back to this with a bit more precise definition in, in the context of the framework, okay? So then let me start with, um, with uh, what I, I seem to always start my talks with this, right? Institutions are in growth. So, so clearly, when, um, when we're concerned about kind of powerful people getting their way, this is uh, in the context of, in a way, complaining that institutions in this country are not working as they should. Um, and, um, and this actually occurs very well with the, with the research that we have had over the last couple of, I mean, but at least for sure the last couple of decades on, um, on institutions, right? So this comes from a previous effort into trying to figure out where growth, growth comes from. The outcome of that research is saying, well, we can explain part of it, but a big part of it we actually, we cannot just using economics, you know, capital and labor and seeing how things work. Um, and then basically the, the research kind of converts into a view that says that, you know, institutions are important and they're a fundamental cause for growth, you know, several papers talk about this. Um, and of course the issue with this is that um, if we want to make a leap from these findings to actual policy recommendations, it's actually a fairly large leap, right? Part of it is because of definitions and other parties because what are really measuring here, right? And in particular for policy recommendation, first thing is, you know, what do we actually mean when we use this word? This has become a little bit of a casual term. And second, what does the link actually work, especially the time, the time dimension? And the reason this is important is because of the following. So if you actually plot um, income per capita to the basic levels on some measures of quality of institutions, you know, this I, I, uh, I pulled this graph from our esteemed uh, chair, from a paper of our esteemed chair. But, uh, you basically always have this relationship, right? That's actually where the, um, where, the, where the literature converged in a way, right? You see that rich countries have institutions that 
on a bunch of measures look better. That's, and poor countries, by and large, have institutions that on a whole bunch of measures look worse. Right? That's the thing. However, this is sadly, it's not to say that if I get a country and I get it to improve institutions in some of these dimensions, I'm going to have an immediate payoff in terms of growth. Right? And I put another graph from our esteemed chair, and basically what we have here is a change in one of these measures of institutions. It's actually relatively long term. This changes in tw over 20 years, okay? In the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, you know, changes in income per capita over the same period, right? You see that now, well, if you squint enough, I guess the relationship is still kind of positive, but way, way, way weaker, right? You don't really see here. Uh, so if you compare, you know, I don't know, the Philippines with, uh, with, uh, whatever, some other country that in the middle, you see the Philippines actually over measures, it improved a lot on, on these measures of, um, of uh, quality of government, but, you know, the payoff in terms of income per capita really doesn't seem to be much better from other countries that are on the same horizontal, um, horizontal. So basically, um, why might that be? Well, it could be either because that's the way the world is. The relationship is only, is actually only very long term, you know, over actually more than decades, in a way, generations, right? And so maybe the world is like this. And in fact, it could actually, you know, there's reasons to believe that this might be the case. In particular, um, the story in the developing world is not that, is not one of secular stagnation where nothing ever happens, right? The story, in fact, is one of volatility. You have periods of long, of big world, big growth, and then just collapses, right? That's, that's what tends to average with low rates of growth over a long period. So in a world that looks like this, then even if over 20 years you get to improve some dimensions of something that actually moves very slowly, the correlation with changes with something that moves actually very volatile is, gonna, is always going to be uh, low. Right? But the other thing is also simply measurement, right? We have, by now, basically, we have a kitchen sink full of measurements of qualities of government, right? Um, and it could simply be, basically, that these measures are simply just not good to look at what happens at the aggregate at the country level and the changes, right? And, especially because so many of these measures really mix outcomes with procedures and, um, and you know, things like rule of law or, um, or, um, or uh, protection of property rights, they might actually look very different in different countries. So you could have very different institutions actually having similar outcomes in terms of fi fi people feeling secure that they're going to get the returns of their investment, right? But depending how you measure this, they're going to look different, and then the graphs no wonder they look all over the place, right? And finally, the big issue is you know, many of these measures are looking as, as things as they are in the books, but in many countries things don't actually work as they are in the books. So then, you know, the book might say, the constitution might say, you know, property rights are protected in this country, so check, but then in practice, you know, anybody can come and steal your goat, so then, you know. Okay, so what this tells me is that we actually need to, um, need to uh, zoom in much more. If you want to be able to say something precise that, that hopefully we can get actually policy recommendations out of it, well, I think we need to zoom in much more about what we mean when we say institutions. Um, especially because if one looks at the literature, this concept is incredibly malleable, right? It's been, it's, you know, it's almost all-encompassing depending on some definitions, you know? So you go from north, you know, the rules of the game, that really includes everything, you know, social institutions, networks, everything, right? So, um, um, some of them are even difficult to think about what they would look like if you saw them in the street, you know, the humanly created devices that determine expectations, you know, that comes from grave and stuff, you know, it's hard to. Um, and other things are really about outcomes that are about procedures, you know, state capacity, people would say this country has good institutions when it has a state that can do stuff, right? Um, but then we really start mixing constraints with means, so it's also very complicated. In fact, a lot of, in a way, even organically at IGC, in a way, we talked a lot about about state capacity, but we talk about basically on the talks yesterday and the day before about taxes, about incentives, right, um, uh, etc. Right, and finally the last one, you know, other people say, well, institutions are good when people get to vote. Well, you know, sure, but we don't have a direct link between this and property right protections or the other things, so things are complicated. So just to add a bit more precision, and because I think it's going to help us in thinking about elite culture, I just focus on what I call the policy determination process, which is basically one a much more subset of the full set that all these concepts could, um, could, uh, could come to include, okay? So what do I mean by this? I just mean the mapping between the power distribution of preference in society into actual government output, okay? Now, government output itself is multidimensional, right? So at least it does two things. It provides a framework 
in which people interact economically, right? So you can think about, you know, property rights, the regulation, laws themselves are, uh, are, this, are this kind of thing, right? So, you, can, you know, you could think of these as services, but I'd like to think a bit much more at providing the environment that is going to let private agents, you know, transact. And then it has another aspect, which is good creation in itself, right? So, so service provision, health, education, social insurance, actual, actual products that enter you and directly the utility function of the customer. Okay. Um, so basically, so what do I mean, you know, so that's kind of to put a little bit of granularity, but you know, to, to take two steps back, what I mean by the policy uh, determination process is simply basically this kind of mapping, right, in which we take as given the preferences and the relative power of different groups in society, right, and it's whatever process that basically ends up generating the policies that the government uh, actually espouses, right? I should say here as a little bit of a footnote that I'm more concerned in, for this talk, I'm, it's not about implementation. So there's another set of issues that would start once we decide what we want to do, maybe we cannot do it because our bureaucracy doesn't work and all kinds of other things. But you know, as I said, you know, if you're interested in this, it is very interesting. There were talks about this yesterday and the day before. And here I'm more interested about the policies themselves. You know, many times we actually see governments defending policies that, are, that look actually, they don't look right when you look them from outside. So that's, that's kind of what we're interested in. Um, okay, so here we're, at least we've narrowed it quite a bit because at least we're not talking about networks and a bunch of other stuff, right? We really are interested about the politics of the country. How do we go from what people want and how powerful they are into what the political process speeds up in terms of output, okay? One thing that I find nice about thinking of the world, about the world like this is because then when I see, you know, policies that uh, I might not like, then at least it gives me, it gives me, you know, two ways in which I can approach this problem. So, they, I might not like them maybe because the power preference distribution in society is not the one that I, I agree with. That could, that could be, because maybe a lot of, maybe lots of people in the society want things that I don't think is what they should be doing, and that's, you know, that's one issue. Or maybe, so it's either basically the inputs of the model, or maybe it's actually the process itself. Maybe the, the, the policy determination process itself is actually broken in some way, right? Um, so then, if we take the first one as given, at least for now, although I'm going to come back to this, then what can we say about the process? So here is where, is where in a way, we really get into the framework part of this, uh, which in a way is this, it's one way of cutting through this morass of issues that we used, in fact, in the, in the background paper uh, that we wrote for uh, DFID Elia with Eliana and other co-authors, which is that um, when you think about what political institutions are supposed to do, they basically have two important elements to them. So what you want out of the political process is somebody to come up with the mandate to, of doing something, right? That's basically what the political process does. So this something that this somebody is supposed to do is what comes out, out of aggregating the preferences of the different people in society, right? So some people might want uh, roads, maybe if we go back here, you know, group one wants roads, group, group two wants, wants uh, you know, education, group three wants other things, and then somehow these things have to be aggregated and give a mandate to whoever is going to win the election, say, and say, well, you, know, you win and you are supposed to do a little bit of roads but a lot of education. Right? So, that's, you know. so this process by which we go from individual preferences to the aggregate is what we basically call the aggregation of preferences. Right? But of course the other element that institutions have to do is get this somebody to actually do the stuff that we're talking to them. And that's what in the language of political economy we call accountability. So this really is about holding the politician that has come out of the process accountable to either the promises he made or what came out of the aggregation of preferences. Okay? Um, so, if we take the accountability first, basically, when you look at the political problem from the accountability point of view, what you do, in a way, is abstract from the conflict of interest between citizens and concentrate on the conflict of interest between the citizens as a whole and the politician or the you know, whoever holds the political power, right? The idea here is very simple, is that in the ideal world, if this person is not doing what he said he would do, or what the citizens want him to do, if accountability works, the citizens can kick this person out and put somebody else. Right? That's basically in the, most, uh, in the most simple way. And then, of course, this kind of way of looking at this problem accommodates two things that accountability should do, right? On the one hand, it should give incentives of the politician of doing what, you know, what he's supposed to do, right? be less corrupt, etc. And on the other hand, of course, it gives, it, it's one way of thinking about 
what tools the citizens have to actually get the type of politician that they want in power. And this is, we can talk about corruption, but more typically we think about thing, issues of competence, you know, that's one way of getting the good people uh, running the country, right? So that's kind of one side of what the policy determination process is supposed to do, right? Hold people accountable to what they said they would do. The other side, of course, is preference aggregation, as we talked. And again, this one is aggregate, you know, this one abstracts a little bit from the politicians themselves. And think about the other dimension of conflict here, which is across citizens. Okay. Um, and here, basically, the details of how this aggregation work is going to depend dramatically on the mechanism by which aggregation holds. You know, elections are very different from a dictatorship, right? Um, and also what the preference cleavage that we're thinking about. Um, typical in this literature is the rich versus the poor, if you want, uh, but in several countries the, the relevant clues are actually across ethnic groups, or it could be geographic, right? Um, but actually I like rich versus poor, especially when we're going to come back to elite capture and how it fits here. Um, so when we're looking at the problem of a political problem from this point of view, then the question that really we're interested in is basically saying, how does the final outcome, the policy that comes out of this process, really reflect the preferences and power of the different groups in society, right? And typically, who will not like the process if it turns out that it, in some exact way, it overweights some particular groups that, in a way, they're always getting their way, right? That's, that's the other way of talking about it. Right? Okay, so, you know, a lot of the projects that, um, that we have funded, actually, from the research program at IGC, as well as a, an overwhelming amount of the research that happens in political economy almost everywhere, can actually be fit, can fit very uh, naturally this framework, in a way. Um, because it, it typically addresses failures in this process, either in the process of aggregating preferences or in the process of keeping politicians accountable, right? So, you know, one big class of, of failures in accountability comes from information. And there's actually, we've just seen this morning, more papers kind of addressing this friction. Um, clearly, if people, if voters don't know what the politician is doing, or it's supposed to do, this, it's going to be very difficult to keep this person accountable, right? So there's been, this, this, has, uh, this has generated, you know, very fertile ground for research in which you can manipulate the information uh, that citizens have and see what this, do, what this does to, the, to their ability to hold politicians accountable. And there's been kind of quite good results coming out of this. So, so the, the, my reading of this literature is that, is that we don't have a one-way street. It's not like every time we provide more information, we're going to get better accountability. But we're, by now, we're, trying, we're starting to triangulate about what kind of information or what kind of channels need to be in place for this actually to have positive effects. And these, these issues have direct implications into how we're going to structure elections, how we're going to structure institutions. So uh, that's one way. Uh, another thing, another way that politicians might be able to escape accountability, of course, is if there are procedural flaws in the way elections work. So, you know, if you can rig the elections, then clearly, you know, the, pro you know, the citizens are going to have a hard time you know, holding you accountable. We've also funded some research here, some in Afghanistan, in Mozambique, in other, in other ways, in which how can you institutionalize um, relatively cheap methods that reduce, you know, the incidence of these kind of issues. And one way, one way of thinking about clientelism is also this, right? Because even if, if citizens have identical preferences, if I can exclude some of them from particular goods, right, I might actually be able to buy myself uh, enough support to survive in power. Right? So this really, one way of thinking about clientelism is that if the politician can exclude, discretionally exclude, exclude people from receiving public goods from the state, even if they all agree on what they would like, he's going to be able to maintain in equilibrium um, some support that he would need. So, um, of course, on the other side, there's also issues, issues in preference aggregation. One of them basically is ethnic politics itself, right? So when, when politics move from thinking about common welfare issues, like, you know, better roads or better hospitals, etc., into purely distributive, distributive issues or split the dollar kind of world, it's going to be extremely difficult from the aggregating system to work, right? Because, the, you know, um, so, so uh, and one way in which we see this dramatically happen is when politics really become ethnic, right? At that point, basically, issues are typically purely redistributive, and then the political process is going to have a very hard time actually really working through this. Um, but also there are issues, and this actually came up in this very interesting session this morning, is, again, information, right? So many times what happens is that preferences are difficult to aggregate because they're actually not well defined at the individual level. But if you actually have systems of deliberation, debate, etc., this actually helps people form preferences 
and hopefully there are preferences that are more aligned with the public good, and this actually, of course, makes institutions have a much easier time in aggregating things. Okay, so now after this was like a very long introduction, let me now go back to the, um, to the, uh, to the, origi the original issue of interest, at least what I was told to talk about, which is uh, elite capture, right? So, and, and, um, so let me start with, uh, you know, I did a little bit of research, and it turns out that actually there is one thing in which you do a Wikipedia search and you come up with a definition that is actually quite accurate, right? So I thought, well, you know, I don't need to search anymore, right? So that's what Wikipedia says if you search this thing, right? Elite capture is where, well, that's not a very, you know, it's Wikipedia, so, but resources are transferred, resources transferred designated for the benefit of the larger population are actually usurped by a few individuals of superior status. I mean, I, I underline these things because they seem to be like the, the main issues, right? And then the status, you know, again, it could be actually of different kinds, different kinds of dimensions that confer this higher status to these agents, right? Um, and in particular, and the second part kind of narrows it a little bit more, individuals or groups take advantage of government programs aimed at distributing resources for the general public, but they use this elite influence to basically get the stuff, right? Now, this is particularly appropriate because at least my, uh, in my, my limited genealogical knowledge of where this term came from, it actually came exactly from these issues of community-driven projects and decentralization, right? So, so uh, basically, as I guess here everybody knows, you know, we have different waves and fads of things that are supposed to be good or bad for development. One of them, you know, about a bit more than a decade ago, was decentralization and we kind of bring power to the people all the way down and you know, and then basically when people started looking at this and what the results of this were, they basically they coined this term of elite capture because it seemed that actually you would transfer the, the resources down and let these people distribute it in however way they see fit. But surprise, surprise, it turns out that however way they see fit seems to disproportionately advantage the, if you want the people of superior status, right? So the traditional thing, you transfer, um, you give autonomy to the villagers to decide how to spend the money for some, you know, to dig some borehole, right, to get water, and then surprise, surprise, you go there and check, and it turns out that the, the borehole is always done right in the backyard of the rich guy in the village. Right? So that's basically the literature where this came from. And the same thing happens with decentralization. Actually, Fernand Barden and Dili Mukherjee have a lot of work on this. You know, you basically give autonomy to these local governments to do stuff, and then it turns out that you see what you see they actually end up doing seems very much aligned with the preferences of the rich people in the village or the powerful people in the village, right? So that's the literature where this comes from. But I think by now this has expanded to this more loose term that I was using at the beginning of the talk, which is not so much, so much macro, but even at the country level, the sense that powerful people are getting away with uh, stuff that they shouldn't be able to. That's basically in terms of policies, in terms of regulation, in terms of everything we've talked about before. Now, how do we put a little bit more discipline into this concept? Well, the first thing I think that it's important to do that the literature hardly ever does, but funny enough, Wikipedia suggests a little bit, is that, you know, there's different ways in which you can be an elite, right? And two, uh, one, one broad-based distinction that I think is important is the difference between political elites and economic elites, right? Um, even though they might end up being intermixed, I suppose. Right? But uh, the idea here is that there are people that are powerful because they control the political power at a particular, par at a particular point in time, right? and they can use this control to actually do things that we don't like. Right? But there are people that are powerful because of the economic structure of the country or their particular capture of certain amount of rents. Right? Now, of course, the tip what typically will end up happening is that if someone is powerful enough in the first sense, and it's in power for long enough, eventually it's going to be powerful <laughs> in the second sense, and probably the other way around. But many times when you see that the distortions that this kind of different power introduces in the economy are actually different. So, one example would be, you know, an economic elite doesn't need to uh, get direct control over the political elite as long as it gets the policies that it wants. For instance, you know, I might, want, I might be uh, a monopolist on a particular corner of the industry in this country. I don't care much about who's in power as long as this guy ensures me that tariffs are going to be high and I'm not going to be suffering, you know, import competition from other people, right? Uh, which, of course, hurts everybody, right? But the, my interests in are, are kind of very concentrated, right? But things can be very bad also in the other end, right? So when we are thinking about uh, populist leaders, for instance, you know, the latest wave 
um, in Latin America are basically an example of a particular elite that has nothing to do with the existing economic elites, and maybe that's precisely why they introduce a set of policies that actually are quite particularly bad for these guys. It turns out they're not good for anybody, but that's it. Except for their own political survival. Right? Okay, so if we put this into the context of the framework that I was describing, the nice thing of cutting you know, the types of elites this way is that also this allows you to apply different paradigms to each one of them. It seems to me that when we're concerned about elite capture on the side of political elites, we're mostly talking about accountability issues. Okay? We're talking about people who are in power today that want to be freed from accountability that is, they want to do whatever they want and we still be able to be in power tomorrow. Okay? And you know, when they want to do this, they're going to do a bunch of things. They, could, you know, they can build the clientelist networks you know, to stay in power tomorrow. They can uh, distort policies for things like uh, generating urban, urban bias. In fact, we've seen a talk about this you know, just a couple of hours ago in the other session, because they know that the urban populace are the people that can actually come and kick them out of power. Right? Uh, or, or otherwise, they can also do, they tend to be typically very concerned with the control of the media. It's for the same thing, right? It's about, about uh, coordination and kind of uh, makes, the, um, makes the accountability systems basically uh, poor. Um, when we think about the economic elites getting policies that disproportionately benefit them, we typically think in terms of aggregation of preference. This is really the classic case in which somebody was actually powerful ex ante, but the political process works in such a way that in fact this power that they had ex ante in fact gets maximized. So they actually they get disproportionately, their interests are disproportionately considered in the actual policies that are put in place afterwards. Um, and we can see things like distort the labor relations, you know, if I'm somebody, I'm an industrialist, probably I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have um, um, labor institutions in this country that, for instance, ensure that salaries are low, and then maybe this might tell you something about uh, uh, how come some countries have strong union policies and others have actually very strong anti-union policies, you know, you can ask about basically who's, you know, who's interested in this, um, or simply the old, the old school crony capitalism, right, maybe what I want is to secure friendly regulation and that this, this, uh, this you know, just benefits a, a small subset of the manufacturing base, which is the one that I control. Okay? Um, as I said before, often they end up in intermixing in practice. You know, that typically happens after long with regimes. Okay? Um, but again, even if when they do not and they keep different, this can still be very costly, and I think the case of populist policy is a good example of that. Right? Um, okay, so why don't we like this? Right, so in the... And here I think it's particularly important the divide between um, elite capture at the local level, this, you know, um, decentralization issues, with the one at the aggregate level, right? At the local level, we're mostly concerned, when we don't like this, it's mostly about distribution, right? So the reason we might not like that the borehole is always done at the backyard of the rich guys, that we wanted this thing to benefit everybody, and now instead of benefiting everybody, it's mostly benefiting, you know, this corner of the village, right? So this is, this is kind of rather unfortunate. Um, it, it definitely reduces the aggregate benefits of this policy, um, but, it's, but again, most of the issue is really about distribution, right? The problem when we go to the country level, elite, elite um, benefits, is that typically we are also concerned about much stronger dynamic effects of this, uh, of this situation. Why? Because at the end of the day, elite capture, whether it's political or it's economic, right, it's something about barriers to entry, right? So when, when, uh, when the political elite has captured the political system, it means that it has been able to erect high barriers to entry into the, economic, into the political market. And the same thing tends to be the case in the economic market. Right? And typically, I guess, you know, these like economist, um, ec the economist view of the world, we tend to think of competition in both these markets, the political and the economic as being kind of the engine of, of, um, of uh, the hope of reaching efficiency, but most important, the engine for growth. Right? Um, so basically the problem is that this is dynamic. If we have elites today that they get more powerful, they're going to get more intense tomorrow. And if they're more intense tomorrow, they're going to be able to, to, you know, to increase these barriers to entry. And what basically this really can have big aggregate consequences for, um, for growth and for the, you know, the general well-being. And if you read, uh, that's at least it's my reading of the paradigms of, say, Asimov or Robinson in one nation scale, or uh, Northern Weingast and other co-authors, you know, in their other view of the world, they're all about, you know, the baseline machine that generates welfare is some variation of Schumpeterian destruction, which means, you know, new ideas come in, they get implemented, the economy works, you know, 
research happens, new developments, they get implemented, the economy works, and what happens when somebody gets strong enough to block this process to protect their own rents is that now we're all aggregate losers because the next step in innovation just doesn't happen. Okay? And this can be innovation both in the political or in the economic realm. Okay? Um, so just, I guess, you know, I'm gonna, don't worry, I'm gonna shut up soon. Well, I'm just gonna conclude basically here, I'm gonna make a few points that I think are actually important. Again, there are gonna be more questions than answers, but especially from the point of view of thinking about economic policy, uh, when, if we think that the world actually is like this, right? And then I'll just conclude with a conclusion of sorts. So, if we believe kind of this particular view of the world, the thing that really comes out of this is that at the end of the day, the distribution of, of power is dynamic, right? So we, we might have a particular economic elite today that if the specialization of the country changes, it will not be, it not, it will not be powerful tomorrow, right? The, the big example is, you know, it used to be that landowners were, uh, were the most uh, economic, you know, the most powerful Asians, say, you know, in medieval England, right? And at some point, you know, they cease to be. Either they change, either because they change their activities or simply because the economy moves on and now all of a sudden control of this particular resource just, you know, doesn't make you powerful, right? So basically the distribution of power changes. And the problem is that actually changes endogenously with what's happening in the economy, okay? Um, now in general, so this is just, as I said, because I want this in the back of our mind for what I'm going to say now, right? Um, political economy issues, as we know, are actually a thorny issue to approach from a policy recommendation perspective, right? especially as economists and especially as outsiders to a particular country, you know, to make uh, recommendations that are very much tinted with what are, thing are going to be the political consequences is problematic for a whole bunch of issues, not least, you know, one of mandate, you know, are we supposed to actually tinker around with things like distribution of power and political power in, in, in recipient countries, right? It's really not obvious. Um, but this doesn't mean that we should ignore these issues because clearly they were going to have strong consequences in whatever policies we advise, right? So, so, you know, the big question here is, you know, should we actually give recommendations based on the current distribution of power? So one possibility is, is to look at the world as a static place. Say, look, I look at this world, these are the powerful actors, these are the weak actors, and then, you know, I'm being called in to give some economic advice. So then the least I could do, I guess that would be, is at least take into account that this is a distribution of power and then, you know, give according recommendation, not thinking about the dis dynamics, but at least thinking about what's implementable here. Right? But of course, the other bigger question is, what, how do we think about the dynamics, right? So again, the first, the, the traditional, well, I guess the traditional economic policy recommendation would completely ignore these facts and simply pretend that one can make recommendations really only looking at the economics, right? And then, but this, thank God, we've moved away from, kind of, hopefully, a little bit, because there's been enough disasters. Uh, so a classic example of this is you move into a country, you see they have enormous food subsidies or fuel subsidies. This clearly distorts this market, is terrible, so you say, well, I'm an economist, this, you should get rid of this. And if somehow you're strong enough, maybe because the country is indebted to the guilds, that you can force the president to get rid of this fuel, subsidy, you know, fuel subsidies, that sadly what happened in many countries in Africa, for instance, that the next step is a civil war, a giant unrest, right? So clearly, since it's very hard to argue that unrest and civil war is actually a better state than, a very, than very distorted policies at the local level, you know, this really tells you something. You really should be taking these things into account, right? So basically, I think the current focus at least is a little bit more cognizant into taking these things into account, right? And this is useful, again, because at least it can tell you where are the main political economic constraints if we want to implement things, right? And also to decide, as somebody who wants to engage in this, which dimensions you might be able to engage to, you know, hope to get traction into the policies being taken by the current, you know, landscape of power in this particular country, right? And maybe you decide actually it's not benefit, you know, maybe we shouldn't really engage with this country at all because, you know, the, the current distribution of political power is such that anything that we recommend that could be good will never be happening, right? So that's, you know, that, that at least tells you, you know, so informs you about this. And that's basically the approach that I, that I call coping with the elites, right? So things are the way they are, and then basically, I think it is best described as saying, as a feasibility study, right? Things are the way they are, and given the way they are, politically, should we push for a given policy, okay? Um, again, I think that's already a big gain from what we used to do, which is completely ignore the fact that there are, there are reasons why certain policies are not in place, right? Um, my view of this is that this naturally leads to the focus that we've seen in, um, in a lot of foreign aid over the last couple of decades, which is 
this, I think this naturally pushes for an, I mean, you know, an advice into micro issues, mostly of service provision, right? Because increasing the level of education, especially at the very basic level, uh, will not have political consequences, at least in the next you know, 20 years or so. Uh, this tends to be, for instance, issues that have, that, you know, they don't wrap anybody the wrong way of the current holders, and then, you know, both the donor and the recipient are happy with these things happening. Right? And the same thing basically with health, right? You know, people being more healthy, is, again, it's not an immediate threat to anybody's economic rents or political rents, so then, again, the supply meets demand again, right? So, you know, the donor comes in, says, I'm going to put, you know, a new hospital here, and then there's, you know, fine, go ahead, right? No problem with this. Um, what's the problem with this? So, and, this and there's been gains with this, so that's, kind of, that's great. The problem is that most other types of economic policies um, at the macro level, but also other policies at the, at the levels of regulation, uh, you know, entry, all these kind of things are going to affect really, I mean, and even actually policy, basically policies that affect how markets work are going to inevitably reallocate rents in society. Right? And of course, this has as a corollary a change in power, and these are the kind of things that will be possibly blocked by the recipient. Right? Um, so then, of course, so first thing is that, you know, we might actually be limited into only proposing policies that we know that their effect in welfare is actually small relative to the big potential gains that we could have, but of course they happen to be out of the feasible set, right? And the, and the worst case scenario is what happens if when we look at a country and we realize that kind of everything that we could propose that is actually good, it's going to be blocked, right? That's basically the case. In that case, you just pack, pack up and go home. Um, but of course, and this, again, don't worry, this is like my second to last slide, so I'm, I'm about to, to get to the end. But I think that's, I'm just going to raise a point that I think is actually very important, which is, if you believe me in what I've said before, there is something inevitable about this. Right? Economic policies will reallocate real rents in society. Right? Um, because uh, this, power, uh, this power distribution, therefore, becomes exogenously dynamic, we might actually want to care more than about the static distribution of power. Why? Because there are policies that might be beneficial today that might be actually in the feasible set, so the current distribution of elite power is actually happening with this particular policy, but they might have the unfortunate consequence of actually entrenching the power of this particular elite, making the currently powerful people more powerful which actually could be bad for what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after, right? So what's the classic case of this? One that I like is, you know, openness, right? So we tend to think that openness, you know, trade, FDI, these things, these things are good for growth. In fact, they are very, one of the few things that are, in fact, robustly correlated with growth, right? I don't know about causality, but, you know. Um, now imagine that, you know, the assets of the current elites, maybe these are economic elites, right, are actually very correlated, very complementary to openness, right? So I will be an example of this. An example of this is my story, I might be wrong here, but this is a little bit how I read the events in Myanmar over the last, you know, few years, right? So basically, here is my reading, and probably wrong, but very simplified reading, you have these cronies of the military regime, somehow they're being able at some point to siphon assets out of the state, this is typically the mines, natural resources, right? Once they control these assets, the situation of being a pariah state is not very great, it's not very good, because if you can only sell um, you know, the minerals to the Chinese, which actually, what, that was the situation at the height of the sanctions, then the Chinese are going to pay you very little, and then these mines are not worth much. So then what do you want to do? Actually, you are the first one who want to open the country. Why? Because your mines, these assets that now you control, are going to be worth a ton more in the world in which the country is open, in the world in which the, the, in which the country is closed, right? Um, so that's great. If you are able to engineer this, and Myanmar has been able to engineer this, you will create growth. This is actually good. In the short term, you know, openness is good. So this is actually going to create a burst of growth. The question is, what's going to happen in the next round? So now these guys are powerful, right? So any other innovation that could happen in this economy, for instance, level playing field, that might actually weaken their position going forward from that point will actually be blocked. And it's in fact, it's going to be more easily blocked now that these guys are more powerful, right? So, it, so when you think in this, in this way, it's, it, you know, you can actually, there's a whole bunch of policies that in fact are very good in the, in the short term economically, 
but that can actually be not so great in the long term um, politically and or for economically. No? Um, and, um, and then the question is, you know, really what's the objective here, right? Because if what we really want to do is create a, create a foundation for uh, inclusive and sustainable growth, then really this really puts us in a conundrum, right? I mean, it's possible that uh, that's the best thing we can do. That's another option. Right? I just want, uh, I'm just flying. I think these, these are issues we should be grappling with. Could still be that the conclusion is, well, the alternative is nothing, so at least we get short-term growth and, you know, we hope for a miracle tomorrow afternoon, right? But, um, but at least we should, you know, we should uh, be taking this into account because many things that look good from the outset, I guess, openness, new FDI laws, these kind of things, when you actually look at the details, it becomes very obvious that they're benefiting a very particular set and typically small set of people in the country, especially, you know, and the devil literally tends to be in the details in these kind of issues. Um, Okay, so let me, I'll just offer here a conclusion of sorts. Again, um, one way of thinking about elite capture is of thinking of failures in the political process in both of the roles that we have highlighted in this framework, right, both in the side of accountability, especially when the elites are political, and in the set of aggregating preferences, especially when the elites are actually of an economic nature. Um, now, elite capture depends on power, and power depends on the economic policies in place, and therefore there's an unavoidable dynamic element to this, that with the policies we're going to affect it, right? Um, now again, we typically tend to shy of this kind of analysis, especially in an explicit manner. I think it's actually very much on the table in an implicit manner, but you know, you, you hardly ever read in the country report or, you know. Um, but, but at least at the very least, this dynamic view suggests that we should have at the very least, you know, a Hippocratic, uh, Check, you know, like the do no harm of the doctors, you know, okay, you know, when we recommend some particular policies, have we actually like, thought through this kind of uh, potential dynamic issues? Okay, so with this, I'll just conclude. Uh, thank you, Gerard. That was an extraordinarily clear um, presentation of an issue that, I mean, like you started out with it, it bounces around in our heads for those of us who are thinking about this, but it's so hard to articulate it uh, and clarify it in such a way that we can even uh, place our existing knowledge in this framework. So I'm, I'm very excited by this, and I'm going to be sharing your slides very broadly. Um, so I've been asked by the IGC and also by our esteemed speaker to offer a brief discussion uh, and before passing it uh, along to Nicholas, who I'm very excited to hear from. Um, this draws on joint work with Lant Pritchett in a paper uh, that Lant, of course, t entitled The Guts of a Gut, or The Last Gut being a, a grand unified theory of growth. And I'm going to just, just talk about one little gut among those other guts here. Um, as well as uh, teaching material, I teach a course on emerging and frontier economies at, 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 at uh, HBS. Uh, as well as policy advising in Liberia. So let me start with a bit of a puzzle. The Republic of the Congo, which I picked on because it's not an IGC country and because I've never been there, so I, I can only offer at best a stylized view, but it's ranked fifth last in the world for the doing business environment as measured by the World Bank. It's been pretty stable in this position. Uh, to pay taxes, it takes 600 hours. To export something, it takes 50 days and 11 documents to import something 54 days, and to enforce a contract uh, a year and a half. So how is this possibly a stable and optimal set of policies? Now, here's uh, 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 also lifting from this uh, paper, but earlier work by Lant and Mary Hallward Dreimeyer, looking at what they call deals versus rules. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, graphs Lant, that Lant has produced. You can see here on the horizontal axis, this is coming from the doing business indicators, the number of days it takes to get a construction permit. On the vertical axis, from the World Bank's own enterprise surveys, the number of days it takes to get a construction permit. The horizontal, you have the de facto, and on the vertical, you have the de jure. One would expect, then, that, that all these points would be populated on the 45-degree line. You know, it takes 90 days, it takes 90 days. But what we find instead is that no matter whether it takes 90 days or 600 days, de jure, it takes 60 days. Uh, 
So this is a pretty ex extraordinary thing. What does it mean? It means that if you're a country in the middle here uh, uh, with a 300-day legal regime for getting a construction permit, you have to work around the rules. You get a deal done instead of following the rules. Now, let me offer a way to, to try to characterize the aggregation of elite preferences that Gerard uh, spoke about. Uh, and, 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 and we suggest mapping the business environment into four quadrants along two dimensions. So one of them is whether, if you're operating in a country like the IGC works in, as a firm, are you there to sell to the domestic market, or are you there to use the factors of production inside that country to export to the rest of the world? Maybe labor is cheap, maybe natural resources can be had at a bargain. So that's one axis. The other is how do firms typically make money? Now, sometimes uh, in, in some markets we have, we have normal market competition. You do product differentiation, you do marketing, you do branding, you, know, you do human resources, all that stuff. And on the other side, you can earn your profits through discretionary rents. Uh, uh, so in this case, you still have to minimize your costs, obviously, but the level of profitability of an investment will depend basically on the deal you got from the government. Uh, and then so by this two by two matrix, we have four distinct groups of, of firms. Uh, on the top right, we have the, the, the rentiers. These would be firms export oriented who make their money through the discretionary uh, rents. So this would be a concession. For example, a production sharing agreement in oil and gas or a mining concession. The, the bottom right, firms serving the domestic market. If you're an independent power producer, you know, the higher your tariff is that you're selling into the grid, the more money you make. If you're a port, the higher charge you're allowed to, uh, uh, the higher price you're allowed to charge to firms that need, because you're the only bottleneck for this otherwise much more um, uh, uh, profitable transaction of importing goods into the country, the higher you're allowed to charge, the more money you can make. Versus in the bottom left, the workforces. These are usually the backbone of an economy. Uh, imagine small-scale farmers, um, individuals and, and, and small businesses in the service sector, light manufacturing. These are firms competing with each other for market share. And then finally, the top left, the magicians. If you can export into a competitive sector, such as manufacturing, garments, business process outsourcing, and so on, uh, we call these magicians because it's kind of free for the country. If a, if a workforce does well, it comes partially at the expense of his competitors. If a power broker does well, it's because he's utilizing uh, some, some um, a fixed amount of rents available by the country. But a if a magician does well, you know, you get more employment and, in fact, other magicians through sort of a Michael Porter cluster effect uh, can do well. So, fine. Uh, each of these groups is going to have a different demand of the state, and they would like different interests. Uh, they would like different sets of regulations, depending on who they are. You can, you can sort of imagine what they are. So now we can map these Within, an, within a country. And this is my fictionalized, stylized Republic of the Congo. We'd have a huge amount of value added uh, in the rentier section. This would be the 60% of exports, or 60% of GDP exports in the oil and gas sector. Uh, this is what generates the rents, usually, that can then be further distributed, often through the power broker quadrant. Uh, the power brokers here are able to be the recyclers of the tax revenue collected by the state, or sometimes it's, e it's even easier for a country to collect its rents from the natural resource exporters through the various um, parastatals and so forth that have their fundamental uh, role in the value chain uh, of the resource exporters. Great for patronage. There's no better way uh, uh, to stay in power than to have friends who are going to keep you in power uh, that are in the power broker quadrant. The workforces are small as a share of the economy, but as a share of the population, they're enormous. And then basically there's no magicians because in an environment uh, in which your uh, business environment is, 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 is structured to favor the power brokers, uh, you're, you're not going to be competitive. As well as having na high natural resource exports, you're just simply not going to be competitive in these other industries. Okay, so getting back to, the, to Gerard's aggregation of preferences and accountability, we end up in a situation with this distribution of elite preferences on the economic side uh, with a deals world. They're going to want basically a bad business environment, and this is optimal. Why is that? Well, the business environment is there to protect the power brokers. 
if, if it takes a, a thousand days to do anything, but you can do it in, in 30 or 20, uh, then that's advantageous to you if you don't want new entrants to come into the sector uh, and, and to take some of your rents. The rentiers, the big oil and gas firms or, or, or mining companies that, you know, that in another world might be able to argue for things, they don't need to because they're, they're already ring fenced. Their business environment is their concession agreement uh, that they've signed with the government, and so uh, they're not lobbying for anything. The workforces facing 100 days to do anything are going to choose to be informal. Why would you enter a system where you're, you're basically uh, going to definitely lose money if you don't have the ability to generate the deals that the power brokers have? And so once you're checked out, you're also checked out of the political process, and you find it hard to lobby for your own interests. When government sits down for business, you're not going to be there at the table. And then there's no magicians. These are the guys who you'd like to tell you how to structure your business environment if you were a benevolent uh, uh, reformer. Uh, but they're simply not there because the economy hasn't allowed them to, to flourish. So then you get this aggregation of preferences that, 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 that perpetuates uh, these, these bad institutions. On the accountability side, we have these deals. Firms, when they want something, those that do have political access are going to prefer to get an individual deal rather than argue for uh, sector-wide reforms that can benefit everyone. So we have deals and not rules, or if you're in uh, uh, Asimoglu Johnson language, uh, you would have, uh, you would be in an extractive outcome as opposed to a inclusive, inclusive exactly. Uh, my apologies, the jet lag. Uh, or if you're in, you're, uh, in a North Wallace wine gas world, um, you would go from natural order to open order. So in this case, uh, thinking about the dynamics of, of, of elite capture, imagine a burst in growth back in here. What's going to happen? The rentiers are going to get more rents, the power brokers are going to get a larger piece of it, and they're going to entrench their existing interests. So again, what's going to happen in the next round? Well, if it's a, it's a, if it's a shock to oil prices, fine, this, this might play out another time. But if, it's, but if it's anything else, uh, then, or then if, it, if that's not your source of growth in the future, you've constricted the ability of the economy to grow. Okay, when can elite interests be good? Sometimes we've just been bashing the elite, but sometimes the elite can work out. Well, if you look at the East Asian tigers, which are sort of the only uh, real examples of countries that have gone from poverty uh, to wealth over the last 50 years, they basically look like this across these four markets. Uh, in order to generate foreign exchange, they needed, and they had no natural resources to speak of, they had to be competitive in, the, in, in manufactured exports. And so they tried to create these magicians. How did they do it? Well, in, in all sorts of ways, but one way in which it's helpful is to not have really expensive imp inputs. So you can't have expensive power or telecom if you're trying to create uh, effective uh, exporters. Another way they do it is they would sometimes take a, a workhorse say a company serving the domestic market, and then give them a monopoly power domestically. Uh, uh, Korea did this with uh, Hyundai. They basically limited the other passenger car manufacturers around 1980, gave Hyundai the domestic monopoly so they could earn tremendous rents, a power broker there, but then they also forced them to be exporting at the same time. And once Hyundai was competitive on an export market, then Korea reopened that market uh, uh, for competition uh, domestically. And so what happens over time is as you, as you grow your magician sector, and also your workhorses are, are useful because they're generating potential magicians, uh, then the economic activity starts to be on the left-hand side of the quadrant. What are these guys like? They like rules. If you're operating in competitive space, the, the clearer the rules, the better they are, uh, and, and the less political uncertainty they are, you're just able to have a better time doing what you're doing. And the more activity that's over on that side, the more that the power brokers will be constrained and they'll be simply regulated monopolies, which are fine to have as long as you have a, co a competent regulator. Um, and so basically here you get a further burst of growth. You push the, the, the bubble to the left and then uh, you can solidify and, and, and get these advances uh, in the political institutions that Gerard spoke about. So for example, 20, 30 years in, uh, places like uh, Korea or Taiwan will democratize. Okay. I'll in
will not see how things are actually working on the ground and, and why uh, some things are taken. So, um, so kind of a good point. Um, also, th you know, we had this discussion with Ethiopia and Rwanda, and this a little bit kind of links a little bit with the issue in, in Korea and the, and the East Asian Tigers. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I definitely don't know enough about Ethiopia and Rwanda to see if, uh, if uh, what we're seeing is just a particularly long burst of growth versus something that really is going to become self-sustainable. I mean, the little I know is that, yes, there is openness, but again, it's not wholesale openness anybody from here. It's actually quite managed. Um, um, but again, the, the problem is that this managing can be, uh, can, can be a consequence of, you know, it can be managing simply because you want to do things right, but it could be managing because that's exactly what allows you to extract rent from the process of opening. So I think, you know, I, again, I don't know enough mm -hmm. to see if this is going to be uh, one or the other. Um, but it's definitely true that, um, that the, the, I think at this point everyone in the room will agree that the old school wholesale recommendation open fully from the beginning, kind of no holds bar, this really, ha I don't think this has worked anywhere. So that, that's yeah. definitely, um, that actually in a way complicates things because this thing would be easy to verify. But clearly even, the best practice is actually already complicated policy, which means that the devils can be in. To till, to till the room. So let me not, uh, I mean, there's this very interesting issue about how elites uh, relax their capture. You know, some readings of, my reading of the Korea story, for instance, is that once you have some economic actors, once you've advantaged enough you know, some particular economic actors, but that are disciplined by the foreign, by having to win the foreign markets, these guys might put some resistance into their monopoly power being taken away in the domestic country. But at this point, these guys are so big that actually even like, 
the share of profits of the domestic market, they can live without it. You know, they would like to have it. So, um, so, so, uh, so these deals can be cut. The, I guess the real worst case scenario is when if they are real power brokers in the in the sense of Eric, right? If, <laughs> if their rents really come out of a specific market failures at the local in the local market, it's going to be extremely difficult to enlist these people on the side of uh, sustainable growth and, and, um, and level playing field. Um, and let's not talk about the close revolution because it, it always shows up in these books <laughs> and at this point, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, can we open it up? Sure. All right. Uh, and, and please, even though it's the third day, please introduce yourself and, and feel free to just join the conversation as opposed to asking questions. All right, we'll start right in the middle. Two things which I wanted to just quickly do. First is to, to flag some work which uh, Drs. David Booth and Sue Unsworth have published recently with DFID and uh, some other international development organizations on thinking and working politically, uh, which is looking at basically a series of uh, kind of programs and external actors who have been able to, uh, basically examining some case studies of where external organizations have been able to align the incentives of elites, work with different power actors, um, and get uh, policies passed which were kind of pro-poor and were implemented as such and sort of uh, spurred economic growth. The, the main question I have is uh, for Dr. Miguel, which is that um, and the IGC is working with a whole range of different actors and different governments. And over the last two days, we've heard a lot about kind of the different interventions which have been experimented with. Um, what I was wondering is if there's going to be any systematic attempt to kind of um, gather kind of the political economy lessons from that experience, how you've been able to get these programs initiated, how you've been able to try and run these experiments, and you know, if there's any lessons which can be learned uh, from that. Uh, in the front. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, it's a very fascinating presentation, sir. Um, as I work for the policy making level, I'm in a difficult position because you talk, told that political economy issues are difficult to approach from a political uh, policy perspective, but basically, in our country, some countries, the elite capture is there in many, uh, I think almost all countries. Also. But if uh, some reforms in legal framework or policy reforms, uh, um, so I think sometimes that um, uh, there is a monopoly or uh, oligopoly or yeah, so more competition in the market or something like that, as you mentioned. So whether these type of things, uh, legal uh, reforms and uh, economic and political reforms, whether that, that can work. Secondly, uh, uh, regarding the importance of institutions, you mentioned about for growth, uh, you mentioned about that. So if you think in terms of a taxation department, very important for growth mobile area. Yeah. So basically, uh, in view of the elite capture, how we can make an organization effective? So that is my question. And so, uh, if we want to uh, give some autonom autonomy, both uh, operational autonomy, financial autonomy to that particular organization, let us for the uh, uh, case of taxation department. So otherwise there are a lot of problems of conflict of interest. So whether that will work, may work if some autonomy can be given. Thank you very much. In the middle? I'll make it easy for you on the, the <laughs> second over. Thanks. Uh, my name is Prabhat. I am from Columbia University. I am a PhD candidate there. Uh, my, my question is uh, ab about this observation which I saw in India last year, where government started a new institutional reform to, to reduce subsidy diversion, but then elections came and uh, they terminated the program. My question is, uh, how does uh, how, how should we think about interaction of electoral cycle with these two type of elite, the political and economic elite? And again, building on Nicola's point, like how should we think differently about them in developing and developed countries? Thanks. Thank you very much. My name is Samuel Wangwe. Um, I'm from Tanzania. Most of the time I've been working in the policy research uh, arena. Uh, but 
but because of the difficulties of trying to understand why some policies don't go through, I decided to be a part-time player in politics also. <laughs> so from these experiences, I'm really impressed by the uh, three presenters. Uh, I think you have really got uh, the issues at hand. That's what you are grappling with. So I would like to comment on the three aspects. I think the, uh, one of the most powerful uh, elements is actually openness. Uh, because some of these, uh, the interest which you see of uh, the elites, uh, they are more powerful under the table. But once issues are brought on the table, uh, actually they tend to give concessions just to survive. Uh, so I think the more we can capitalize on openness, uh, the more we can keep on gaining some concessions from, uh, from them and distribute power uh, to the citizens. Uh, second, I see the understanding of uh, who the groups are in society as extremely important for economists to understand. Uh, when we push policy issues, identifying who the gainers in society are and actually using them to push the case. Our experience is actually to work better than when you whisper good results to the policy makers. Ge equip the interest groups who are gainers and they push, you will see what you pushed privately beginning to work. So I think identification of which groups are gainers in, what policy, in the policy proposals and use the gainers to push the case uh, is, a, is a very important. So our understanding of the political economy uh, I think is extremely important. The last point I would like to make is uh, there is increasing um, link between the economic and the political uh, elites, at least experience in my country. It's very difficult to see this separately. The link between them is so uh, close. Um, and these uh, power brokers, they seem to, they, they prevent policy action, uh, not openly. Uh, you agree in a, an open forum, the business community, and we agree we are going to push this. But under the table, there are these power brokers who prevent uh, uh, action. So the recognition of this link between the economic and the political elites and where their, 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 their links are strongest, I think it's important for us to, to understand when we make policy proposals in order to be able to, to design how best to push the policies through in the interest of the citizens. Thank you very much. Great discussion. Yeah, again, uh, my name is Ashwin and I'm from Pakistan. Uh, my question is this, that you know, while you've covered most of the su uh, subjects in the political economy, one big factor which you did not cover is the interest of the developed world in the third world. Because a lot of times what we have seen is this, that the first world while they talk about being open and democratic and all of those things, but we still see them supporting the undemocratic governments, the military rulers, the juntas, the, all of those people. I wonder how can we change that aspect of this policy from the developed world? Because, you know, on the one hand, the developed world has gained all of the good things which come out of democracy. But yet, in other places we see that the developer, the developed world does not really support that. And uh, so can we do something about that? That'll be for Nicholas <laughs> <laughs> and in the second row. Nicholas, I think if I've heard you correctly, the elite capture is not only in the third world or developing countries, it, it is even in the first world in, in, in UK, USA. But there is a qualitative difference between, say, in the developed country and the underdeveloped country. In the developed country or in the first world, there is a convergence between elite capture and the hegemony. Hegemony in the uh, political sense, ideological sense, academic sense, moral sense, 
So the elite capture is not visible in that sense. But the elite capture which is in the uh, third world countries, which is in the underdeveloped countries, the elite capture appears to be much more crude. It's, it, 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 the capture is not followed or it is, or it is not preceded by the ideological hegemony, moral hegemony and various other things. So uh, I think one needs to do these uh, differences. Uh, I mean, one has to take that into consideration. One part I just wanted to mention in the context of India, that uh, till recently, say, uh, till recently means about a decade or so, unlike in America and others, where there was a convergence between economic and the political elites. For example, Rockefeller could become the president of uh, America or Ford could become the president of India, uh, America. That was not the case in a, in a, in a place like uh, India. But that possibility is increasingly uh, visible, that a uh, topmost uh, financial elite could one day become the president. Now, if you see, mo if you go down in the panchayat level, the, the economically most powerful person who is the uh, uh, de facto elite, he always becomes the de jure elite whenever the elections takes place. But that is changing. That is changing either pressure from above or there is a uh, pressure from below. So these things have, so it's a much more complicated thing. I think when we are talking about the elite capture, one has to differentiate between the different shades which are visible globally and nationally. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. my name is Shaival Gupta. I am from uh, India. Thank you. These, these are such wonderful uh, insights, and, uh, and I hope us academics are taking notes because m many of these comments, including three at a time by our colleague from Tanzania, each of these could be an interesting research paper developed. So let's continue uh, the discussion with the audience. Xavier Lukasha, I'm a former DFID uh, private sector advisor, and I've just finished this morning a paper for DFID Afghanistan on, uh, on recommendations. So I welcome very much this new approach by DFID to mix up the kind of uh, political economy, I should say, expertise to help us design better programs at the micro and meso level. But as it is a kind of framework session, I understand these framework sessions are kind of asking questions to IGC how can IGC research support? the kind of uh, uh, context papers to help us do better our work. And I have two points to, to uh, help also some of the questions here. Uh, is there any research around what has happened in Tunisia, for instance, around the kind of uh, problems I understand there were some kind of parliamentary commissions learning what uh, the former president, Mr. Ben Ali, and his family managed to capture and that we as donors we didn't see anything as it has Western powers. I'm French and we supported Tunisia for, for decades. And we didn't do very much to avoid that they would capture from a family and elite point of view also all the economic policy which thwarted actually competition and uh, alternative ways of, uh, of creating new businesses and, and competing with their, uh, with their, with their assets. And also, is IGC willing to do something which is very difficult, is to look at uh, the military uh, economic interests in many countries. I don't want to name countries here because I want to have my visas next time. I am, <laughs> I am, I'm winning a, a difficult contract to look at certain countries, but I can quote non-IGC countries. Uh, for instance, Algeria where we used to work with, in the past, with CDC, or also, you mentioned parastatals, oil and gas parastatals in many of these countries are black boxes, and you do not ignore that recently in a very important country, they, kick out, they kicked out a reform-minded um, uh, governor of a central bank because he or she started to ask questions about the management of the forex uh, because this black box parastatal did not play by the rules of the game. So is IGC considering to do work on, the, uh, uh, on this kind of uh, glass ceiling that is created by the importance of the military 
systems, economic systems in many countries where we, we do business. Thank you. And we'll just take these last two and then uh, uh, get Gerard to, to answer everything with Nicholas. Um, hi, I'm Paul Minaletti. I'm a researcher working in Myanmar at the Center for Economic and Social Development. And yeah, I think to follow on from the comment from the gentleman from Pakistan, I think it's, it's really important to incorporate um, how, whether elites is the right word, but how international organizations subvert the policymaking process as well. And I think what's, Myanmar wrote a foreign investment law in 2012, which was done with very little outside help, and it was some fairly inexperienced policymakers that wrote it, is now being rewritten, but the people advising are the IFC. Given that IFC make money out of making investments in countries, I'm quite skeptical whether they're really going to challenge the tax holidays, get rid of them, because the IFC directly benefit from having tax holidays. And I think particularly with, there's been an awful lot of bad bilateral trade agreements signed by Myanmar recently. Again, it's fairly inexperienced policymakers negotiating with various international countries and agreeing to 20, 30 year commitments that put Myanmar in a terrible position. And I think it's, it's important to remember how um, an awful lot of both developing and developed foreign countries try to subvert the policy making process for their own interests as well. And over there, the last question or comment, because comments are even better. Uh, my name is Kai Kaus, Kai Kaus Ahmed. I work uh, in the government of Bangladesh. Um, well, I have a comment uh, and then followed by a question is, I want to reverse the uh, idea about elitism is that, you see, whether it is static or dynamic, and if you look that elites, both politically and economic elites, they are not always static. There are some families, you know, which goes uh, beyond decades, but if it is dynamic, that means people are changing both at the central level as well as local level, right? So how about then, is it related to some sort of like managerial, you know, capacity or efficiency? Because when you want to do something, then you need some people who can implement it better and whether they are the you know, kind of guys who can implement it better. And that's why it is, uh, is it a capture or you know, it's a kind of like you know, natural phenomenon? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. First word, Gerard. Well, let me answer absolutely every question. <laughs> so we have what, three minutes? Three so minutes. <laughs> so. The other group's going until 3.15, so we'll steal maybe uh, four no, more. No, four more. Not steal so much from my, from your hand. An exchange for, for some, so some let me just kernels talk about of wisdom. Maybe, if, you know, rather than answer a specific question, maybe I'll try to talk a bit more on um, like general things that have shown up, clearly. So, so um, one issue that came up is the issue of what I would call, what I think the community calls a, st a stakeholder analysis, right? This is, this is something that has a, that is, I think, at least it's, I think basically this stakeholder analysis, which is basically looking at, well, how can we sell this thing, you know, here is some group that would benefit from this, let's work to them, right, that this was suggested. I think that's basically the way in which the first approach that I was talking about has finally kind of solidified in the donor community, right? So I think that now these things are, I mean, you guys can tell me better because uh, kind of you're actually doing this thing for, for a living. But that, that you know, that's the way this can, that's the way political economy analysis has really solidified in the in the policy uh, advice community, right? So that look look at the universe of people that can be affected by this policy and see if you can actually see some angle uh, that can make uh, that can put this policy in the feasible setting. Frankly, um, so this is uh, which means that it's definitely the case that things tend to work much better if you get the actual people that would benefit to advocate for it rather to you than for you to kind of barge in like the proverbial elephant and, uh, and try to do so. Um, so this is, um, yeah, so it's kind of 
that's definitely the case. And in a way, that's the way it So if at any point you actually have to feel that you have to... So again, there is something really uneasy here because this is basically intervening in the politics or the policy making of a country. And there's something, you know, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, distasteful about this. Um, so it makes to me that, that it makes a lot of sense to actually make it through the political agents, in a way, through the, you know, if, if, uh, if through, through the actual groups that are already in. That seems actually that's much more legitimate in, in my view. Right? It's not you are not coming from you might coming from an opinion from outside, but you're actually articulating through people that have the same opinion inside. That actually makes a lot seems to have less issues of mandate. You know? yeah. Another issue that was raised um, is the issue of transparency. I think this is extremely important. Um, and that's exactly why many times the devil is in the details rather than open, you know, and on the table, right? Um, and this is something that we do not understand very well as academics, I think, partly because a lot of the, a lot of the work on this has, um, uh, you know, it's basically work in kind of in full information, you know, people know what happens and then you ask yourself basically relative power, etc. But a lot of what happens basically is that uh, uh, many times preferences themselves are not well defined in the following sense. So you can have groups that are, um, that know the outcome they want, but they don't know very well the mapping from specific policies to that outcome. And it's precisely from this uncertainty in this mapping that the elites are able to capture the, the process, right? Um, because, because, you know, if you don't know I mean, the, the classic thing is trade policy, right? If you don't really understand that, uh, that you know, high tariffs are actually, you know, making your life worse every day when you go to the market, it's going to be very hard um, for you to articulate your opposition to this, right? Well, if this was basically articulated in terms of direct transfers <laughs> to the pockets of the elite, then you would have people in the street, you know, much easily. So, so that's, uh, uh, well, I want to say anything else. Um, well, there's, there's, so th there have been some references to, to ICC work. So it's in the, in the phases so far in ICC work, we've, we've focused a lot more, and that's why I wanted to present a framework like this, um, in terms of um, this <laughs> specific, specific inst if you want, low-level institutional change that can provide benefits. That's why kind of a lot of our research is about changing uh, information structure in elections and changing, um, you know, the way appointments are, are made and, um, and, um, and maybe some anti-corruption initiatives or maybe the way incentives are given to some tax collectors like there's these experiments in Pakistan. So they are actually very precise, um, very precise questions that hopefully can provide kind of high academic level precise answer answers as well. Um, maybe at some point we'll have to engage much more with the, with the, with these kind of higher level questions um, that so far it's, it's hard to see how we bring kind of the full machinery of academic, especially, especially a statistical analysis to each because they te the data points tend to be very different from each other, right? Um, um, and that's definitely something to think about. I mean, the mandate so far has, we have interpreted much more about things that we can translate directly into policy. Uh, but clearly, you know, at least, at least that was the spirit of this talk, definitely, is that we actually probably need to think about at a higher level and the question of how we articulate this um, through IGC. That's really it. Nicholas? Okay, just very quickly. Um, the phrase political economy analysis, uh, I was at a thing with the World Bank the other day, and someone said, God, you guys with your terms, political economy analysis is just knowing what's actually happening and why. Uh, and I thought that's, that's it, you know, it, it, we, we tend to put people off with our terms. Somebody else said, you know, the problem with political economy specialists is they arrive and they tell you why your program is going to fail, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and this links to my, my colleague from Tanzania who said, well, how about reform champions? And I think there's been a movement in political economy approaches from this sort of very deterministic structural approach that says these are the embedded rules of the game, these are the enduring institutions, these are the fixed parameters, to saying, hold on a minute, how about, how about the more dynamic elements? How about human agency? How about reform champions? How about some of the, really th these spaces where things actually can happen? I think that's a really welcome shift. I think you can go too far and put too much stock on reform champions who then might get sacked or moved somewhere else and, and start thinking in terms of individuals rather than incentive structures which shape 
how individuals behave as well. So I think it's about getting the balance there. Um, I really welcome the point about hegemony. I think um, legitimacy didn't, didn't come up as well in, in, in the report, but maybe that's a good way of distinguishing between the kinds of elite capture that we see in, in an environment like the DRC uh, to, you know, you could say there's elements of elite capture in Scandinavia probably, but obviously there's a major difference. And I, I'm not sure it's just degree. I think uh, our chief economist the other day reflected it's about whether it's a positive sum game, a zero sum game, or a negative sum game in this. You know, are the elites growing the pie for everyone at the same time as taking a big slice for themselves, or are they just looking for a bigger slice at the direct expense of, of other people? I think that's one, one way in to looking at it. Um, and then lastly, no one's mentioned gender. We've got three uh, white men sitting at the front, and we've had questions, I think, only from ma men in the audience. There's a whole other agenda to this, which is thinking about um, how inequalities and politics and elite incentives play out for women and girls. I mentioned our Secretary of State was pushing us on growth. She's also absolutely pushing us to think about the empowerment of women and girls alongside our focus on growth, alongside our focus on economic transformation. So that's a sort of uh, collective criticism, myself included, that these issues often don't get as much attention as they should. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention, your insights, and, and I don't want these to, to stay here in this room. If, if, I mean, particularly if you're uh, one of IGC's partners in, in the country, and there's an opportunity here even just to make a point, and you can identify that setting that could provide the research, uh, you know, opportunity uh, to make the point that you described. That could be a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, chance to, to do this co-production of research that we spoke about this morning. Um, so approach your, your favorite lead academic or program director, and, uh, uh, and let's talk specifics. Okay, enjoy the break. Thanks. inspired me to like be more energetic. Turns out so much fun up there. Doesn't he have fun up there? He was like, yeah, I can't wait to say the next point. No, I haven't. I'm happy to, yeah. 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 Yes, yes? Is that all? Thank you very much. Thank you. No, thank you. Like, uh, you're, you're, you're spot on and, and you're like bang, bang, bang with the uh, The what? Deals and rules. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, I arrived 